see if that does a mini record. And it seems to be working recording right now. Yeah. Okay. get started. Um, so we're back here um, um, so for data mining. So um, if you're well if you're watching online I guess the cable's missing so you're not streaming but the video will be up at some point soon. Um, so let's just I, I just want to quick mention there are a couple of changes in the, in the timing of the office hours. Um, so, um, so these are the regular times for um, for office hours um, throughout the semester. Now I, I think these will be pretty stable, um, and uh, there are a few office hours which we extended, um, and those were posted on Canvas. So we're trying to I'll try and have a little bit more office hours in the week before um, homework assignments are due. So. Um, and please give me feedback if there aren't enough office hours, everyone is going in at a certain time and you don't have time to meet with the TA, you know. Um, so if, um, um, so if anything is not working out, please let me know and we'll try and adjust things to make it work. All right, um, but I, you know, I don't want to hear at the end of the semester that I can never get office hours. I'd like to hear that at the start of the semester or kind of at the point when it becomes an issue. And we'll, I'll, I'll try and make sure that there's enough um, time to meet with TAs and, and myself. Um, okay, so uh, just a reminder, I've got some example posters up here still. They'll be here after class today, and then after that I'll just have them in my office. Um, so if you want to see more examples, uh, the last time in class will be after class today. Um, 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 so you can come up here and, and, and take a look at them. Um, just a reminder, um, the, uh, the first homework assignment is due um, is is going to be due on Wednesday. It's due at 2:45 on Canvas, right? So so you have time to turn it in and still come to class. Okay. So uh, um, and uh, um, and then the the project proposal is due in a week from Wednesday. Um, the project proposal itself does not need to be very long, right? But it needs to be kind of an uh, idea of the of the of the. You should have found some group, a uh, group to work with. It's great to post kind of requests on, on Canvas. That's a great way to find, find partners on stuff. Um, and a kind of an outline of the topic that you're hoping to work on. You can refine this over the semester. It's not a contract. You can change it. But you'll just have to kind of do an updated proposal if you change it later on. But I need, I want you to have something started at this point. If you have questions about whether something's a good project, um, don't just turn the proposal and wait for feedback. Please come and ask me ahead of time. I'm, I've been doing this for a few years now. I'm pretty good at getting a sense of what works and what doesn't work for projects, and maybe kind of shifting your focus a little bit. Okay, um, there'll be, it's, it's hard for me to get a lot of very individualized focus for everyone at the same time in the class. Um, I'll try and do that at some point in the middle of the semester, um, but the best way is to come and try and talk to me before and after class or my office hours and, and so forth, and kind of come at random times and spread it out so that not everyone is coming at the same time. Um, uh, okay, um, so then the schedule for the next couple of days, we're looking at um, kind of this part of the schedule here. We talked about the card similarity and, and, and k-grams. Um, if you notice, I changed it to uppercase vid, that means the video is posted. I posted uh, kind of right 
I posted my slides next to the notes. Like if you click on these, there. If you click on min hashing, there's de de detailed notes. And if you click on here, you should. Oh, that's not working. But uh, you should be able to see. Um, where do we go? Okay. Um, hopefully, I'll fix the link to this S right there, and, and that'll be my slides from the notes I wrote. wrote <coughs> um, okay, so uh, we talked about Jacquard similar in kgrams. We're talking about min hashing and LSH, and uh, these are techniques to kind of. We're talking about comparing sets now instead of documents. And these are going to be ways to kind of easily compare sets at large scale. Okay, and uh, so it's going to be over the next two lectures, you're going to kind of see how this works. For the lecture today, we're going to be talking about this technique called um, um, uh, um, some min hashing. And this will be specific for. Um, um, Jacquard similarity. Um, there are versions of this that work for other sorts of similarities, but the most common is 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 the Jacquard one. That's also the simplest. And it's going to be a way of going from sets to a different representation. So ultimately, we want to get to a special sort of um, um, what we want to get to is a um, binary vector representation. And we're going to start by doing it by showing how to go to this matrix notation, this matrix representation of the sets. And then from there, how to get to this <laughs> binary vector representation. And actually, what this is going to be doing is from sets, it's going to go to many different matrices. And then each matrix is going to give you one element of this binary vector representation. Um, but what we're going to, and then we're going to show that you can kind of shortcut this using, um, shortcut this using, um, uh, 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 um, so using hashing. Okay, so this will be um, so the lecture today. The, the way where we generate a bunch of matrices and this gives us this binary vector is kind of, is slower, is not really the way you'd implement it, but it's precise and it's, it's, easier to explain um, uh, um, so why this works using this kind of going through this matrix representation. The hashing, you kind of get a little bit more air in the process. Um, and and it's, it's a, maybe a little bit less clear why it works. But we'll try, this will be the efficient way how to, how to implement this. Okay, so, um, so that'll be the plan. And then the lecture on Wednesday will be to um, compare this representation using locality sensitive hashing. Okay, locality sensitive hashing will be again using hash functions but in a very different way than before. Not we want them to kind of with with uh, independently collide with low probability, but we want nearby things to hash nearby each other is, is the main idea. And the binary vector representation will allow us to use LSA. LSH is a more general tool that we can use for including distance and stuff, and we'll start to see that on Wednesday as, as well. Okay. Um, so um, before we start, I just want to re review the Jacquard similarity. Um, so the Jacquard similarity between two sets A and B, right? This was equal to a, the size of A intersection B divided by A, the size of A and union B. And so if we have two sets, A equals 0, 1, 2, 5, and 6, and B is equal to 0, 2, 3, 5, and, and 7, then this expression, in this case, is the intersection is equal to 0, 2, and, and 5. And the, and the union here is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7. Right, so this is equal to 3 over, 3 over, over 7. Okay, so the, 
Similarity between these two sets, A and B over here, is 3 sevenths, right? If this was, if they were more similar to each other, you'd have a larger number here instead of 3 sevenths, right? That 7 a little bit better. Um, so if they were less similar, you'd have a smaller number here, right? So that's the idea of similarity, in particular, Jacquard similarity. Okay, so, um, and if you remember the setting we had before, we had, we were considering a large number of documents, and we converted all of them into this set representation, and these were these large sets. And we wanted to either find do documents which are um, near duplicates of each other, or on a query document, is it close to any of the other documents. And we want to do this without checking all pairs, or without, kind of, on the query, checking the distance against all of them, okay? And so eventually LSH will allow us to do that, but we first are going to need to do this minute hashing to get to this binary vector representation. Yeah? When you use Jacquard similarity, you ever run into issues with, um, like, floating point errors with that division <laughs> uh, operation? Does that ever just get, like, practically small, like, even though there are differences between it, but... Uh, so, um, so, um, so one of the nice things about Jacquard is that it, it only depends on the elements that are in the sets A and B, right? It doesn't, you could think of this could be all the words, like if, if each of the elements is a possible pair of words, say we use um, these, these two grams over word vectors, right, over the words. And so there could be this incredibly large number of pairs of words in the dictionary, right? And you're worried that this becomes really large. But the, that never shows up. The number of pairs of words in the dictionary never shows up in Jacquard similarity. It's only of the two documents, I have these pair of, I have the union of the pair of words in the intersection, and neither of these numbers gets too big. Right? So Jacquard similarity kind of avoids this issue for the, for the most part. Um, there could be other types of similarity that does not avoid this issue. Right? And that, that might come up, but that's one of the reasons why Jacquard similarity is good. Um, as you'll see, most of what we talk about will be pretty robust to one or two um, changes in the data points. And because it's robust to that, it'll, it'll end up also being robust to, like, it won't have these, uh, these numerical issues. That'll generally be, that'll generally be the case. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so what is this matrix representation? So let's consider, um, let's go through an example of how to do this, and then I'll kind of um, write out the formalism. So we have sets um, one, two, five, and, and, and I'm going to use an example with four sets to kind of show how this works, but in, in general you'll have, have, have many more. Um, right, S4 is Okay, so I, I'm, I have these four sets, and so for instance, the Jacquard similarity um, between sets one and set three is going to be equal to um, two over uh, two and five, right? Um, over one, two, three, four, five, right? So this is two-fifths, right? Okay, so I've got these four sets here. Um, <coughs> and so, so I want to represent them as a matrix. And so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep track of um, each element on the, this y-axis here. Okay, and then for each of the sets, um, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna just keep a binary vector to see um, if the element is going to be in the set, right? So for um, S1 has one, two, and five, and so it has zero in these other locations. Um, S2 has only a one for three. S3 is looks like this and S4 is uh, uh, 
Um, so like that, okay? And so I can think of representing these four sets as this matrix, and I'm gonna kind of manipulate this matrix randomly to get kind of a representation of, of these sets. Okay, so um, <coughs> basically you can see that um, if two vectors are similar to each other, they're gonna have a lot in common, right? So if, again, our example with um, S1 and S3, they have, they have two and they have five in common, right? So these are in common, there are two out of five things are the same. Right? Um, so, and, and this matrix is going to be kind of uh, not a, you know, like, if you're doing this for, for like, uh, k grams, this is not a great representation. This is going to be mostly zeros, right? So, if I'm storing this, maybe I use some sparse representation in, inside of a, a matrix library, but otherwise, it's not really the right way to kind of represent it inside the disk, but it'll be useful to think about what's going on here. Uh, uh, um, so, okay, so now we're going to use randomness to give us kind of um, a, an identifier for each of the sets, which is going to be good in expectation. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I, I want to somehow get a signature that it, I want to get a single number that represents each of these columns that if that number is exactly the same, that indicates that the columns are close. Okay, so I want to get a single number. And so one and three should more likely have the same number than say one, two and one. Two and one should never have the same number because they have no overlap with each other. Yeah. Uh, how do you determine the threshold of whether they're very similar? So, um, so the, the, the threshold is, so what's going to happen is the expectation they have a collision will be exactly the Descartes similarity. Now, the, and the question of how to determine a threshold if they're similar to each other, that's going to be a question we'll tackle on Wednesday. That's kind of a different sort of question, and it's going to depend on the problem. Okay, so in this case, we're not going to need to worry about a threshold right now. We're just going to exactly replicate the Descartes similarity in expectation. Okay, and the trick to doing this is going to be um, a random um, reorder of, of the rows. Okay, so I'm going to randomly reorder the rows. Okay, so let's randomly reorder these rows. We'll go 2, 5, 6, 1, 4, 3. Okay, so I have the same set of six elements. Right? And, it, and we'll see in general, I won't even need to know what all the elements are when I use hashing. But for right now, assume I know all the possible elements and I've randomly reordered them. Right? So now I'm going to look at my three sets. Um, okay? And, and I'm going to refill out this matrix. And I've just randomly reordered this, the, the rows of this matrix. Right? So now 2 is 1. 0, 1, 0. 5 is, again, 1, 0, 1, 0. 6 is 0, 0, 0, 1. 1 is 1, 0, 0, 1. 4 is 0, 0, 1, 1. And 3 is 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so I've just randomly reordered these rows. Okay, so now for each of the uh, of the sets, I'm going to find the leading one. So the top row that has a one in it, and that's going to be my label. Okay, so for S, S1, I'm going to go and get a two. For S2, I'm going to go down to three, and I'm going to get a three. For, S, for S3, I'm going to go one, I'm going to get a two, and S4, I'm going to go down to 6, right, it's, it's going to be the 6. So I'm going to have this mapping, um, this mapping, S1 is going to map to 2, S2 is going to map to 3, S3 is going to map to 2, and, and uh, S4 is going to map to 6. Okay? So, uh, 
So this is going to give, there's randomness in how I reordered the rows, and that determines this mapping M here. Okay, so now I'm going to claim that my estimate of the Jacquard similarity between S1 and say SI and SJ, okay, between two sets is going to be 1 if M of SI is equal to M of SJ and 0 um, so otherwise. Okay, so I'm going to estimate the Jacquard similarity as 1 as large as it can be if, if the M value matches and 0 otherwise. Okay, so it's kind of a stupid estimate in some ways, right? I know the value is between 0 and 1. It's probably not going to be exactly 1. It's probably not going to be exactly 0. Um, but I'm going to estimate 0 or 1. And, and I'm going to be able to show that the expected value of the approximate Jacquard similarity is exactly equal to the Jacquard similarity between SI and SJ. Right? So even though it's, it's either 0 or 1, the expected value is going to be exactly right. Yeah? Is it again that we do this multiple times to get a better estimate? Yes. Yes. Uh, 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 um, so that's exactly going to be that idea. That's how it's going to work. Right? Um, except where you can get a better estimate that way. Um, but ex instead, we're just going to keep around uh, a vector of one zeros. We're going to create a bunch of these estimators, and we're going to keep a, the, a list of, um, we're going to kind of think of having a, a bunch of things and check how many times that they map. We're going to use it a little bit differently on Wednesday with locality sense of hashing. But initially, we'll be able to just put a bunch of these together and take the average, right? And that will give us a good es estimator. So I'll, I'll, I'll work through this in more detail. Yeah, so you're, it's, it's the right thing to be thinking about. Yeah? So is this so that we have a data that has 10,000 or a million rows, and we can just shuffle around a bunch of times until we're pretty sure that they're similar? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem valuable with just the six rows. It seems like we can manage right. it around it. Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there are a couple of. Um, there are a couple of advantages of, of doing this. So we're going to be able to um, calculate this with, with hashing. So um, we can calculate these, these signature vectors, which are a, a bunch of these random reordering m values. Right? We're going to create these, these signature vectors um, independently for each of the sets ahead of time. Right? And then we're going to have these signature vectors and just compare these. And these will be easier than comparing sets. There's also going to allow us to do locality sense of hashing, which we'll describe on, on Wednesday. Okay, so by itself, this, this actually is, is, is not going to be that useful. But it's going to allow us to do more cool stuff next. All right, so. Um, so but the basic procedure kind of and, and this is kind of a little bit of a wasteful way to do it, but just for, just refresh, you have the sets, you, you, you turn them into binary vectors, a one for each row that's in the set, you randomly reorder these rows, and this gives us a signature by the first one that's in each of the rows. Um, for each column, the first one, that gives us some signature. Okay? And so, what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, think of we're going to have um, k um, random reorders, okay? Um, we'll, we'll call this um, i equals, or we'll say j equals 1 to up to, up to k. And, and so for each set, at set, set si, what we're going to do is we're going to create a, um, a um, value m, um, m1 um, of si, m2 of 
SI up to MK of SI. Okay. Each of these is, is going to be some value in between um, um, one and, and the largest possible number of things, right? So each of these, so this could be um, some vector here. So this vector, in the case was, it could be two, it could be seven, it could be 1,000 and, or 10,023 um, up to 18, right? So I'm gonna get a bunch of these, of these numbers in this vector. Right, each of the, each of the, um, each of the elements, the jth element is gonna correspond with the jth random reordering of this matrix. And I'm gonna do this for SI. Um, so, so SI, I, I'm gonna get a vector VI. Let's, if I do this for SI prime, I'm gonna get a vector VI prime. Right, so it, if, if I get, if I have a different set, I'm going to get a, a different vector here, you know, I, I, I'm going to get a different vector, and then I can compare these vectors by saying these elements matched with, with each other, and these elements matched with each other, and I'm going to count how many elements match. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I'm confused. How does this tie with the with the Jacquard approximation estimate? Uh, um, so right. So okay. So I had before before I had that this Jacquard hat similarity right, was equal to one if mj of, let's call this, the Jacquard hat of si and si prime is the same if si equals mj of si, um, si prime equals mj of si, otherwise it's zero. Okay, so right, and, and so this is the jth one, right? And I'm, I'm going to create an overall Jacquard similarity, which is going to be one um, estimate, which will be one over k, sum of j equals to one up to k of Jacquard similarity approximate of the jth one here. Oh, I see. Of uh, between set i prime and and i. So essentially comparing column-wise. Right, so now I have these row vectors the way I wrote it, and I'm going to compare column-wise, and I'm going to get essentially, so an estimate here, I'm going to get a zero, this will be a one, this will be a zero, and this will be a one, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to take all of these zeros and ones, I'm going to average them, right? And if, if half of them are ones, half are zeros, my estimate's going to be one half, right? Right, so I'm, now this, yeah. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking like one set, and you're shuffling and if you're seeing that whether the ones occur in the same places. Yes, uh, but I just care about the top one, right? I'm really, I'm, I'm really only caring about the top one. You're doing this for only one set, right? So I'm, well, it's the same random reordering I use in, in each element of this VI matrix, right? So I, I apply the same random reordering for the first element for set SI and SI prime. I apply the same random reordering for the second element in VI and VI prime. So right? what, what is prime? What is SI prime? So the, these are two, two different sets. They could be set one and set three. Right, let me make this. Um, this is equals three. This is equal to one. Right, so this is equal to V3. This is equal to V1. Right, this is comparing between set um, S3 and S1. Right, this is S1 and S3, right? I, I'm just kind of uh, overusing I and J otherwise, so I use I prime. So, yeah. so just, so just uh, to like simplify it a little more, J would be 
which reorder, like the the number of reorderings, and uh, like where how far we are in the algorithm, like the algorithm. So if we reorder it once, then J is equal. It's more computationally efficient. We'll see, and it'll allow us to do locality sensitive hashing, which was how the first search engines Alta Vista were actually built. And we'll see the locality sensitive hashing is actually the also trick for dealing with high dimensional um, Euclidean vectors. And it's one of the best ways to determine nearest neighbors in that setting as well. And those will also come up. So, well, it's because we're going to be able to do locality sense of passion, is, is the short answer. It also gives us a signature, which is a little bit easier to deal with than in other settings. But the locality sense of passion is one of the main reasons. Yeah. So, um, I have a question uh, that uh, uh, if, if, if uh, the two uh, uh, things that we are comparing are. Uh, Quite like fifty percent different. Then the number of uh, number of comparisons that we have to do between SI and SI dash check out similarity using this man hash that we have to um, compute will be comparatively lesser. But what if the documents are very similar and uh, we, uh, so the number of comparisons that we have to do in that case will be very high. Um. So then. Like if they're very similar, we'll we'll detect they're very similar early on because we'll do a bunch of comparisons and they're going to have a lot of ones, right? Like we'll start to see that that pretty quickly, right? Let's say you have two documents with Jacquard similarity 0.9, you're probably going to say I only care about documents with Jacquard similarity greater than 0.3, right? And I start testing them. I do 10 signatures and I see that they match on eight of them, right? I didn't get 0.9 correctly. But I'm sh pretty sure it's about 0.3 and I can stop. Right? That's generally how this is going to work. In fact, instead, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to know how many to do ahead of time. We're just going to have to pick a number and, and, and live with it. But we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this more on Wednesday. And, and a little, we'll do some analysis later in class today. So is there, so uh, I, I understand that we're doing random reordering of rows. Why aren't we just doing like a? Uh, like just like shuffling them one by one in a circular manner. Why wouldn't we just do that? Because oh, that gives you a very good idea of. Because the ordering may be biased in some way. I might get a bunch of ones in a row for one, and then a bunch of ones in a row for another, and it may have some weird effects that I don't understand how that will work. I'm going to go. What what I'm going to do right now is to kind of prove this. Okay, I'll prove this. It's not very hard proof. And we'll see why random reordering works so well. Um, and th hopefully that will answer a bunch of the questions for you. OK. Um, all right. So um, OK. Um, uh, why does the Jacquard similarity, let's say, between sets S1 and S2 in expectation equal the Jacquard similarity between S1 and S2? Okay. Yeah. Can you just show the previous slide once? Yeah. So we're, we're going to get we're going to say the Jacquard similarity half is right in expectation, and so it, that means that if I take the average of things which are right in expectation, then this better estimate is also going to be right in expectation. Okay. So we're going to get this for free to be part of central limit theorem and all that. Which, um, so who's heard of the central limit theorem before? Who has not heard of this? Okay, good. So you should believe that expectation carries over and the estimation gets better. And we'll mention this later in the lecture today. I'll show one formal way of, of looking at this. Okay. Um, okay, one, the, and we'll also see that, this will also see why the fact that we don't need to worry about the rows that don't exist for either of the, um, for either of the two sets we care about. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the rows. I'm gonna say there are three types of of rows. Okay, so if I do a random reordering of a row, the row doesn't change, right? So there are three types of rows, and I'm gonna say that, and, and I'm gonna say that there are. Um, I'm gonna say T X is gonna be um, the. I'm just gonna worry about the number of rows of rows. Um, that um, S1 and S2 have a 1, right? So these are the ones where they both have that element. 
Um, Ty is going to be the number of rows where um, exactly one of S1 and S2 have a 1. That means the other one has a 0. Other has a 0. Okay, so this is the one where they don't match, and Tz is going to be the number of, of rows where S1 and S2 have a 0. So both of them have a 0. Okay, right? These are the only three types of rows, if I, if I define them this way. Right, I could distinguish there are two types of ty rows, right? But let's. But it turns out I just need to characterize them in that one. Way. Okay. Okay. So now the key observation is that the Jacquard similarity between S1 and S2 is going to be exactly um, tx divided by tx plus ty. Right? Um, this is the intersection, the size of the intersection is Tx. The number of rows where they both have ones. And Tx plus Ty is the size of the union. Right? It's at least one of them has a one, that's the size of the union. That's Tx plus Ty. Tz does not show up anywhere. Right? So those other sets of rows where they both had zeros, those weird word combinations that never occur. Um, those are those don't show up here at all, right? Jacquard similarity had this nice property. Okay. Okay. So now th that means to um, to um, to understand um, the uh, how well this J S hat estimate works, I can ignore the T Z rows. This implies. I can um, can ignore I can ignore the um, t zeros. All of these that had all zeros, I can ignore those completely. I just have to worry about the t x and the and the t y rows. Um, and so, what determines whether they have the same? Now I can say that there is a um, um, a collision, that means that their estimator is the same, um, ms1 equals ms2, if and only if um, th that the, uh, of the t, um, of the, of the tx and ty rows, a tx row is at the top in the random reordering, right? So if I look at the ordering and I'm think of I'm random reordering them, um, and I just care about the tx and ty rows, that the one that has the highest value is a tx row. If that occurs, then they're going to have the same signature. If the first one is a ty row, that means one of them will get a one for that row. The other one will get a one for something else. I don't know what that is, but it will be different, so it won't collide. Right? So the the probability that I get a collision, which is um, so the um, the probability of the um, uh, of the collision, okay, is going to be exactly equal to. Um, is the expected, I can argue, is the expected value of JS hat, right? And this is going to be equal to um, the size of Tx over Tx plus T, Ty. Can you see this down here? Okay, so it's going to be exactly equal to um, this, the, this, the probability collision is going to be equal to the, um, the, the estimator I get, right? Um, I'm only going to get a collision if I get a um, if th these two values are the same, and that means that I must have a tx row as the highest among all tx and ty rows. And the probability that that happens is I can select one of them has to be um, one of the rows has to be the highest one. The probability is a tx row and not one of all the rows is t tx over 
Tx plus Ty, right? Why does that relate to the expected value of the estimator? Right, so, so this is the, so, um, so let's say um, one row of the Tx and Ty rows, one of those is going to be the top row, okay? Um, so if I pick a random row from all the Tx and Ty rows and say this one will be the top, I don't care what the rest of them are. What's the probability the one I pick is a Tx row? It's the number of Tx rows divided by the number of Tx and Ty rows. Right? And that's exactly equal to my estimator, which is the probability collision. Right? And this is exactly equal to the Jacquard similarity. Right? So the expected value of my estimator is exactly equal to the Jacquard similarity. Okay, so this is, in expectation, this is a good estimator. Okay. Yeah. The, the, then they're both zero, so um, both of the of the the signatures skip down to the next row, right? So I, I don't care. The first one's a T zero. I can ignore it, right? Because it's not going to create my M this this M value estimator. Both of them, right? If you remember in here, if for for S two, right? If it's if, if I'm looking at S2 and S4, they're both zeros here. So for S2 and S4, these are both T zeros. And because my estimator skipped down past these, right? And until I finally got to, this is a TY row between S2 and S4, and so that means I don't get a collision. Right, and there are no TX rows for for S2 and S4 in this example, right? There are no TX rows. So the probability of getting a collision is zero, which is the right, um, which is the right Jacquard similarity is zero, right? So this works as well. Yeah. And the next slide can So the last formula is uh, JS bar. So what it is called? Uh, mean JS or what? Uh, so the, 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 this is my overall Jacquard estimator. Right, or bar JS. Sure. It's like a mean on the right, you have to take it's, the mean of the approximate. Yes, right, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sample mean of the, the approximate. Maybe uh, we'll be using this, uh, the mean we calculated just now. Uh, will we be using this mean we calculated? Um, so it turns out we won't need to directly use this mean, but I'll, I'll analyze it later on in this, in this, uh, in this lecture. Yeah, I'll analyze how accurate this is. I mean, I know it has a right expected value, but uh, can we say something more about how accurate the estimate is? Right? And, I, and we haven't even given you a language to say that, to say how to describe this yet, but hopefully I will if I get to that. Okay, so, um, okay, so hopefully you kind of see procedurally how this could work, although this is not how you should implement it, right? Um, but, but you believe that I could do these random row reorderings and I get an estimator which in expectation gives me a good estimate, right? And we haven't seen how to use this effectively yet, but you have to wait till Wednesday for that, okay? Well, let me, um, I'm going to describe uh, soon how to do this faster with hashing. I just want to mention one more thing. Um, top k, um, so, uh, top k sketches. So in practice, there's, there's a slightly more complex trick that, that people tend to use um, to, to create these signatures that works slightly better but is considerably more complicated to implement and you have to worry about a lot more things about it. Um, so let's say I have, um, <coughs> some estimators that, that look like this, and let's just look at one of these sets, right? And let's say it's 0, 1, 0, 1, um, 1, 0. Okay, and so, so I'm going to do a top K sketch instead of a top um, just, um, ju just the min hash idea, is I'm going to use, let's say K equals 2, then I'm going to use the top two ones. So I'm going to get a value of 5 and 3. 
So my representation of m of s1 is going to be 5, 3, instead of just 5. Okay, but if I have three things I need to keep, then it would be 5, 3, 6, right? It would keep the top three of them. Okay, it turns out that this is a significantly better signature um, than, than just keeping the top thing. It, it's going to concentrate, kind of give you a much more concentrated estimator than, than the other thing. And it's going to be better than taking k independent hashes. And if you do it correctly, which is trickier, it can be done much faster. So I just want to mention that, that in practice, there's going to be this other idea, these bottom k or these top k sketches, which is kind of, um, is you can see some real difference in practice. But they're more complicated. I'm not going to discuss them the rest of the course. I just want to mention these. Yeah. So when you finally equate uh, the m doubles, do you exactly match the individual elements? Yeah, I need to exactly match all the elements. Now, I may want to repeat this a few times to amplify it a little bit. but um, but. This will work work better than if I if I only get to do a um, hundred reorders. It's better to do ten reorders or or twenty reorders five times than doing a hundred and, and get uh, a link ten or link twenty signature than to do a um, hundred different reorders and link one signature. It turns out that works a bit better, but it's a little bit trickier to work with, right? In implement, yeah. What do you do like K three? You only have two elements. Um, yeah, this is one of the details you have to work out. Um, then you can put some like some dummy things in there. Most of the things you deal with are going to have um, kind of hundreds of, of elements. Think of hundreds of things of text, and but the right. So so the scale of k is usually not that big. That just is an issue. But there are ways to deal with this, and this is one of the ways that this is a lot messier to deal with than than the other thing. Okay, but. If you find implementations of these, these you can notice the difference in these implementations. They actually work better. Yeah. Is the Jacquard approximation the same thing? Like, do they have to be exactly matching? Or yeah, they have to be exactly matching. But you can repeat it to amplify it. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about amplification this lecture and Wednesday as well, and how to think about that. So as I just mentioned, there's I, in the notes, uh, I, I mentioned the, the original paper that defined these, but there's been a lot of work in hashing that has kind of made this more and more, more efficient. Um, 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 so people like Mikkelthorup and Ping Li have done a lot of work in this area, um, if you're interested. OK. Um, OK, so how do we do this more efficient? Um, so we'll call this the fast min hashing algorithm. Um, okay, and your the second homework assignment you're going to implement this, so so make sure you're paying attention. Um, or or you can look at the video or the notes, but um, might as well pay attention. Um, okay, so the idea is I'm going to replace um, the replace the reorders um, with hash functions. Okay? So instead of doing a full reorder of a table, I'm just going to have a hash function. Okay? So I'm going to have hash functions, hash functions, h1, h2, up to um, hk. Right? So for each of these, um, each of the reorders, I'm going to have a hash function. Right? And so, so what is this hash function is doing? So hj is going to take, um, take, take each of the elements of the set, right? Um, element of, of, of set. And it's going to map it to some domain of size n, right? Some, some large number, right? So let's say um, this is equal to um, 1 to up to, say, um, um, 10,024. Right? Uh, I don't know how large it needs to be. Probably, you know, about as large as the number of, of objects you have in your, um, your, your typical document is probably fine. Sometimes you can go larger, you can go smaller. It's, it, it, it's kind of the number of bits you need is, is logarithmic in the size. It's not a big deal. Okay. 
So let's say I map it to uh, to a number between ten uh, to be between um, one and ten twenty four, for instance. Um, okay, and then so then, and I the goal is going to be to create from a set from a set I. Um, let's just call this set, right? Um, for each set, um, I'm going to create. See, from a set, I'm going to create a signature vector, right, which is going to be v1, v2, up to vk, where each, um, so basically v2 is, is going to replace m2 of s, right? So instead of getting this m2 value or mj value of s, right, so in general vj is going to replace mj of s. This corresponds with the jth reordering. So I'm going to get a list of k values the same way I did before, and, and I care, and with two sets, I want to see how many of these match. Right? Um, so, so, so this is what I want to do. And um, so, so how I'm going to implement this is, uh, let's put a box here. Um, okay, so let's let's write out the um, let's um, write out the this code, um, the pseudocode um, for every element in S, right? So I is an element of the set, right? So I can read over the set, and each element in the set, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something with it, right? And then for um, for each of the hash functions for j equals 1 to k, right? So this is over all of the hash functions, right? For each of the hash functions, I'm going to say if hash of j of the element i is less than or equal to, or is, um, or is just less than, less than vj, which is the element I already have for that hash function. If it's less than the element I already have, maybe I initialize them all at infinity somehow. If it's less than that, then I just replace it. Then I say vj gets the hash half of j of i. Okay? So this is the whole algorithm right here. Okay, this is how I create these hashes. Okay, so what's, what's happening here, if we look at just one hash function, Right, so ignore um, this part of the loop and just say we're looking at just one of the hash functions here. Right, I just want to keep track of everything is hashing to a number between 1 and 1024, and I want to keep track of the smallest one. Right, that's the one that occurs first. So a way of thinking about this hash function is that I have this table, and every element, instead of uh, you know, doing a perfect reordering, I'm mapping it to a random row. Every time I see it, you know, there's a one-to-one -one deterministic correspondence. Every element I see maps to a random row in here. Um, and so, it may be that two elements map to the same row by accident, right? But um, we know from, uh, from birthday paradox that um, if, if I make the size of n large enough, this will be rare. And also, I only care about if the first one collides, and that's an even smaller problem, right? So if I set n big enough, the probably that the lowest one collides is like one out of a thousand. That's okay. Um, okay. So if I set n large enough, the probably that I get something messed up is is pretty small. Okay. So but what's happening is the hash function is kind of almost doing like a random reordering, but it might actually assign two things to the same spot in the reorder. Okay, so if I close my eyes and I ignore this probability, which is small enough, then this basically works. Okay, it's a little bit harder to analyze, but you can analyze it similar to what I did before and show that um, up to some small amount of extra error, it's going to give me the same sort of expectation results. Okay, and now if I, the reason I'm putting this, the for loop in here instead of I could have put this part outside the for loop on over the elements of S. That means I only need to read my data set once. 
So as, the, as, I'm reading, as I'm creating the k-grams, I can immediately pass it through all the hash functions and update my, my vectors, right? So I just need to read the data set once and kind of I can maintain these signature vectors as I go. Yeah. Um, would you give an example of what S going to be looks like from the table? Sure, yeah. So let's let's go let's go through well, let me get a new page to do this. I don't think I have space. Okay, so let's do this with the single um, that's so I've got the original ordering here. Um, and I'm going to have a set which is going to be 1, 3, and 6. Okay, so the original table ordering is going to be 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. All right, so the, the, this is the original part of the table. And I'm going to have a hash function. And the hash function is going to do, um, it's going to map from 1, it's going to map to 2. Um, 2 is going to map to 4, 3 is going to map to uh, um, 6, um, 4 is going to map to 4, 5 is going to map to 1, and 6 is going to map to 3. Okay, so this is a, a, a hash function. And notice that nothing mapped to 5, <coughs> and 2 and 4 both map to 4. Okay. Um, but turns out that's not going to, that's going to be okay. Right, so now I'm going to go through the elements in the list. Right, let's, let's go through these lists. And I'm going to set the V initially to infinity. Right, and so now um, I, only have a, I only have one element I'm looking at. I can do a bunch of hash functions in parallel, right? Are these mapping just random? Yeah, and, and this I chose this random essentially. Oh. Yeah, I just defined some hash function, right? So, so I'm going to use... You're going to use, um, you, you know, like one of these cryptographic ones or built-in ones to do this with some random salt or arbitrary salt, right? Okay, so initially my one value signature is infinity. I do one, I map that to two, right? So initially, so I'm going to process one. V is going to be mapped. It's less than infinity, so it's going to get a value two. You know, look at, um, I'm, I'm going to look at three. I don't need to look at the zeros. I look at the next, I process one, I'm going to look at three. Three maps to six, right? So um, two is less than six, so I don't do anything, right? Um, so V is still equals to two because two is less than six, right? And then I'm going to look at six. Six is going to map two is less than three. So V is still equal to 2. OK, and I stop. This is my signature. In practice, I'm going to have a set. This will be hash 1. I'm going to have hash function 2, which is going to have 1 to 3, 2 to 5, 3 to 1, 4 to 6, 5 to 2, and 6 to 6. Right, And so this was the V1 signature. And so the V2 signature is going to end up being 1. Right, so I'm going to, 1 is going to map to 3, then, um, and then 3 is going to map to 1, that's less than 3, and 6 is going to map to 6, that's larger, right? So I get the V2 signature will be 1 eventually. Okay, and I'll do, I'll do a bunch of these. Right, and, and notice I only need to read over the set. I did not need to read over the whole table. So I don't need to reorder the whole table. The hash table will be defined um, implicitly. So I won't even need to write this all out. I just need to call it. Okay, you can store a hash function um, much smaller space than, than, uh, than storing this whole hash, hash map. Okay, so I've really, um, I don't need to store a lot of space to create these signatures. <coughs> Maybe a silly question. Then how do I end up using these signatures? Just like I was using. We'll see that. We'll we'll, we'll see that on Wednesday. Okay. Okay. So th this is this is kind of the summary with hash functions. I can create this much more efficient. I only have to read over my data set once. That means I can do it as I'm creating the uh, the, the k grams. Right. I can scan over it, creating the k grams. 
And if I cr see the same k-gram twice, well, the hash function is deterministic. It'll map to the same value. So I don't even need to keep track of if I saw something twice. But this is why this technique cannot handle counts, right? If I see the same k, I'm only going to be able to, to deal with sets and not with counts using this approach. Yeah. Will we have the same vector b for all the sets? Or do we have different v's? So the, the point is, they're each going to get a different signature vector v. Right? Now the algorithm and the hash functions I'm going to use are going to be the same for all the sets. Right? The hash functions, um, the hash um, functions are um, fixed for all sets. Okay, so, so think of it as I'm going to have H, which is going to be the set of these hash functions. Okay, and there's going to be a function that depends on uppercase H that goes from a set to um, this, this vector in our K. Right, so this is going to be uh, you putting in a k-dimensional vector. There's a function that depends on all k of the hash functions that's going to take a set and give me a k-dimensional vector. And it's going to have the property that the number of collisions um, or the, ex the, the fraction of collisions is a good estimator of the Jacquard symbol. So uh, is the signature corresponding to the V or S? The signature is the V vector. So now it is a representation of S. So I'm gonna, this is going to be um, a V S and this is going to be like a signature vector or a sketch vector. So, so it's not that uh, numerical value, is that uh, kind of equation? Like a v it's, it's going to be, I'm eventually going to get out this vector here, right? Right, I'm going to set with these initially all infinity. I'm going to run through here, and I'm going to keep updating them with the smallest value of And I'm going to get a length k vector, v. That's going to be a representation of s. Right? And so this is, it's approximate representation. It's not exactly capturing s, but it's going to do a pretty good job. And it's going to be easier to work with this than with sets, which are going to be harder to kind of compare, I have a whole set of sets. How do I determine which ones are close quickly without looking at all of them? I don't know how to do that, but I do know how to do it with these vectors. And we'll see that on one side. Okay. Good. Okay. So we have, uh, good. So I have a little bit of time left. So I want to go back and um, talk a little bit about the um, central limit theorem turn of hopping bounds and how to do that to analyze how big k should be at a good, uh, a good estimate here. Okay. Um, okay, so the, um, so just to review, all, I think everyone basically uh, said that they knew what the central limit theorem was, but ju just to review the basic idea here is I'm going to have um, and then I'm going to tell you a specific version of the chernoff hopping bounds, which is in the bonus question on your homework. And I'm going to apply it to say how big k should be to get a good estimate. Okay? So I'm going to have a set of, um, we're going to say R of R um, random um, um, variables. Okay? Um, and so, if these random variables are i, i, d, then I can apply this, and we, and, and, and Sunipa talked about i, d, if that means um, uh, identically and independently distributed, then I'm going to be able to talk about the central limit theorem. Okay? It doesn't matter what the distribution is to say the central limit theorem. To apply chernoff hopping bound, we're going to need to know a little bit about the distribution. All right, so now what will be interesting is to look at some average um, random variable, um, 1 over r. So I'm going to take the average of all of these random variables, a, right? And the central limit theorem says that the expectation of a is going to be the same as the expectation of each of the xi. They're all identically distributed, so they all have the same expected value, right? So I retain the expected value. 
and also that the variance of, of A is going to be equal to the variance of each of the xi, again this is the same for all of them, um, divided by R. Okay, so the variance is going to go down at a rate of 1 over R. Okay, and that the distribution, the PDF, um, you know, the, the value of A is going to converge, it's going to converge to a, um, a normal distribution. Right, so the normal distribution has the expected value of A and this is roughly the square root of the variance of A, the distance to the, the sharpest point. Okay, so it's gonna kind of look like a Gaussian. How fast it converges depends on the distribution, but this is roughly the central limit theorem. Okay, so typically in, in uh, data mining, we don't care about all of this distribution so much. We're just gonna care about um, the, the probability that, it's, that the value we get, our estimate, A is going to be, if we realize this with actual data, our estimate um, A hat, I want to know the probability that's very far away from the expected value. I want that to be small. That's all I care about. It could be either of these tails here. Right? I, want, I want the probability that it's far from the expected value to be small. Okay, and so this is typically written as a probably approximate correct. So um, probably approximately um, um, correct. Um, correct here. Okay, th that's when I have um, some estimate. Um, I'm going to call this A. Um, I want it to be close to the expected value of some random variable or some, some quantity of a data I'm actually observing. So I want to say the probability that it's, it's greater than some distance, that this is some error, is small. Okay, so this is going to be the um, error um, um, tolerance here. And this is my probability of, of failure. This is um, um, what I want to find. And this is my estimate. OK? It's often, we often get the estimate with an average of a bunch of observations, but you could do other stuff as well. OK? Um, in the case here, A was the the average of an IED random variable, <coughs> and that's the central limit theorem. We want to state that this is the common way to state these sort of, how to bound these probabilistic algorithms in data mining and machine learning. And we want, um, in general, we want um, epsilon and delta small. Okay, how s we want them to be as small as possible, so we want to get some sort of bound. Um, and we can, um, so an algorithm, algorithm may have, um, has R steps, right? This is the number of random variables we average to get A, right? Or this is the number of observations we're able to make, sort of thing, okay? So this is kind of be a standard setting for understanding um, randomized algorithms or understanding the error in a bunch of random observations. Okay, it's kind of, there are two dual forms of this, but this is a standard setting, <coughs> okay? Um, so, one kind of a general way to bound this, a powerful way to do this, and usually the, the tool that's most often used is called a chernoff hoffman bound. Okay, and so this is going to be a setting, and this is going to be a way to bound the size of those tails. I want to say the probability I fall on those tails, right? So if I look at this picture, this is some, uh, if I annotate this, this is some distance epsilon, right? This is my air tolerance. I want this to be 
Um, I want to say I have a very small air tolerance, and um, the size of these, the, the, the size of these is delta. Say this is delta over two, this is delta over two. I want the volume of those tails to be small, even if I go out a small distance, right? So I'd rather have it that it looks like this instead of more special. <coughs> So the turn off hopping way is a way of bounding off. Yeah. Uh, where was the air tolerance on the last one? Where's the what? Air tolerance. I think I'm getting air tolerance. The air tolerance is the, the distance. My estimate is from what I want. And usually what I want will be an expected value. Um, usually that's what comes up. Will that be on the previous graph? And the expected value is the true the true value here. When I do a random, um, I take a bunch of random variables, I think they're average, it'll fall somewhere in here, and I want it to be close to this. Okay? So the turn off Hofting bound is a specific way of dealing with this when I have these IID random variables, x1, um, xr. <coughs> they don't quite need to be IID, but what, um, what I want to compare, and I want to compare versus a 1 over r sum over i equals 1 to r xi. Right? So I, so I, I want to compare to this average. Um, and I'm going to assume, um, the only thing I want to assume about these xi variables is that there's some delta, and that, um, which is b minus a, where um, such that each xi must be in the range A to B. I have a hard upper and lower bound on the range. Okay? So in a lot of cases, in the original Chernoff bound, this was just 0 and 1. And that's going to be our case with the Jacquard similarity. We're going to get these <coughs> estimates, which are 0 or 1. And we want to estimate the expected value of these estimates. We want to get close to the expected value, which we know is the exact Jacquard similarity. Right? So, so that, that would make this delta equal to a 1 here. Okay, so you see this delta term, just think of it as a 1 if you're confused right now. Okay, and so there's this general property. So the probability, and this is going to look exactly like what we want for the pack bound, that A minus the expected value of Xi is going to be greater than epsilon, right? So this is what we want for the pack bound here. And this is going to be less than 2 to the ex to e to the power, when I write x, that's e to the power, right? e to the power minus, um, <coughs> it's going to be um, 2r epsilon squared over, um, I think I can just do, um, there are a few forms of this I'm trying to write down in simple form, delta squared. Okay. So I can, this is basically this lowercase delta, this problem, this, the, the volume of the tails here. The two is because it's two-sided. There are slightly tighter forms of this, but this form is a lot easier to deal with. So I usually just write this form. Okay, so the probability, if I go further out, then this E is going to be larger, and this probably is going to be smaller. If I allow smaller air, then I'm going to have a larger tail. Right? And this is just a formula that you can plug in here. Okay, so, okay, so let's see what happens if, in the case with Jacquard similarity and our Jacquard similarity estimates, yeah? Won't the variance come in the denominator? Uh, there's a version called the um, so called the Chebyshev inequality that has a version with where you use the variance. Um, the variance does not go in here, right? You cannot get a bound that looks like this quite with the variance, right? You can say it needs to, the, ex, the, the, the distribution needs to decay exponentially and the variance allows it to decay polynomially. So you can't quite get an exponential tail bound using the variance in place of this delta. You need these hard upper limit bounds. <coughs> yeah. um, there's like a version of that where in special cases you can use it, but it's for a very restricted range of values. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, 
Okay, so this kind of looks kind of complicated. If you understand this pack setting, if you can think about this, then this is what we want. We just need to figure out what is this delta here, right? Um, and then we can solve for r. How big does r need to be if we fix epsilon and delta? And that's just algebraic manipulation. Let's go see what this is for the Jacquard similarity. For, for, the, for the Jacquard estimate, right, for the Jacquard estimate, we have delta, um, delta equals 1, right? Because the values is either takes um, for the Jacquard hat because it takes either a 0 or a 1, right? So, the, and, um, so, um, so let's say that we wanted to get the property that J Jacquard bar, right, this bar estimate where we take these k things, is close to the true, remember the expected value is the true Jacquard similarity. So let's say the difference from the two true Jacquard similarity is going to be um, point, um, let's just do point 0.1 here. Right, is point 0.1, is, is, is you know, point 0.1 Jacquard similarity off. Right, and so this will be less than or equal to two times exponential of minus two and we did k of these instead of r, so I'm going to change r to k. So we have r equals to k here, times um, 0 0.1 squared divided by delta squared. This delta squared was just 1. Um, right? So I can ignore that. Right? So this is less than or equal to 2 to um, e to the power minus 2k. Um, and point 0.1 squared is equal to 1 over 100. Right? <coughs> okay. So this means that, um, let's say I wanted this to be small. If I want this to be small, I kind of want this value to be greater than 1. Right? If, if, as this gets much greater than 1, this drops really quickly. Right? So if I put k is equal to 500 here, let's say I say, um, k equals to 500 trials, right? Then what's going to happen here? Um, mark, mark this in red. So k equals 500. Then this is going to be 2 exponent of minus 1,000 divided by 100. That's e to the minus 10. What's e to the minus 10 is going to be super small, right? Um, so it's 2 times e to the minus 10, but it's going to be something, something very, very small. This is equal to e to the minus 10. Right, so if I do 500 trials, then I want similarity error. This is my epsilon here. If I want a similar error of 0.1 and I do 500 trials, the probability that I'm going to be more than 0.1 off is 2 times e to the minus 10, which is like super small. Right, if I did something like a... Um, 400 trials, it would still be 2 to the e to the, um, or let's say the 200 trials, it would be 2 to the e to the minus uh, uh, 4 or something, right? Which is still, still pretty small. Okay. So this part drops, the probability of filler drops pretty quickly. Um, this part um, is kind of, uh, you, you have to make this pretty large to get a good estimate, right? But it, the tails drop exponentially. Okay, so in the bonus question, you need to kind of do something like this. You may need to solve, maybe solve for k, or you solve for epsilon, or solve for delta, and that's usually how these problems work. You kind of set this up, and then you figure out, okay, if I'm allowed this, um, this amount probably a failure, maybe I want to make this 1 out of 100, and I have 100 trials, how big can I, how small can I make epsilon? You can ask those questions as well by just doing some algebra. Okay, so this was a little bit rushed. We won't need to do this other than the bonus question, but this sort of way of thinking of this probably approximate correct is going to show up in class. So I'm going to use this language again. I know I did this rush, so when we do this language, I'll try and make sure we kind of remind you about what this means again. Great, so there are posters up here. Um, kind of have a look at last year's posters, otherwise they'll be in my office. Homework is due 2.45 on Wednesday, not at midnight, it's at 2.45.